there you are. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to um, what the textbook calls the next unit in the textbook, that is. Uh, the units in the textbook are slightly different from the units in my class. The units in the textbook are three in total, and uh, we're in the, entering the middle one, and it's called Towards Confederation, so towards 1867. And it contains the following chapters. Chapter 5, which is War and British Conquest, and we're going to enter, the, uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, here you see a picture of General Wolfe, the British general who died, and uh, but did win the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. Chapter six, the United States breaks away. In chapter six, we're going to do American history, most significantly the War of Independence. In chapter seven, we're talking about the Great Migration and Democracy. That's what it's called, uh, Great Migration in terms of people towards Canada. And we're talking about some internal Canadian conflicts. Canada basically becoming more like what it is today. And then chapter eight is sort of the rubber stamp where um, uh, Johnny MacDonald, here with the big curls uh, and his government um, form Canada, as we know it, in uh, in confederation, where all the where all the provinces join together, basically. Good. Chapter five. I've divided up chapter five slides into three parts because the textbook kind of gives me three parts of chapter five. So the first part is called the struggle for Acadia. And we know Acadia by the other name, Nova Scotia. So last chapter, we talked about competition, but it was mostly towards trade. This chapter, we're going to talk about competition. It was mostly in political power. So we can call chapter four, in a way, mercantilism. Uh, and, and we can call this one perhaps somewhat imperialism. Yes. Okay. Nova Scotia, uh, a fantastic place. Um, it is there where it's red. Let's look at what Nova Scotia looks like in a quick video. Um, Nova Scotia is sort of a uh, picturesque European vistas, uh, mixes with uh, this the ocean shore. It's, uh, it's quite beautiful. We're not going to watch the whole thing. Um, and I think if there would be a place in this world I could live, that it's perhaps because it reminds me a little bit of the Netherlands, it would be Nova Scotia. Um, different climate, for sure. And it looks, it looks quite nice. We've seen this map before. Nova Scotia, when the Mi'kmaq lived there, these are the, tri the what do we call this, the districts of the Mi'kmaq. And they met, of course, in the Grand Council, a um, place called Mi'kma'ki, by the Mi'kmaq. Here we see some Mi'kmaq people in their traditional clothing. This photo was taken in approximately 1868. So we're already seeing 250 years of European contact after when this photo was taken. But presumably this is somewhat traditional clothing. 
He received the wigwams they built. So unlike the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee who built these long houses, um, these were um, wigwams. Okay, this is the Mi'kmaq flag. The white significa, uh, uh, means poof, stands for the purity of creation. The red cross, um, which seems awfully Christian to me, but signifies the four directions. And I wonder if it had had a Christian influence. The sun uh, are the forces of the day and the moon the forces of the night. Um, I think that's one of the wonderful things about uh, First Nation teachings is that there's often... Uh, a big recognition for uh, day and night, not uh, in a Western perspective, uh, Abrahamic perspective, where we see them as good and evil, but just as um, perhaps more Eastern, a sort of a yin yang. They're both part of the whole thing, and and, and they're both equally um, equally part of it, and not necessarily judged as good and evil. That's that's rather Abrahamic, you know, uh, Islamic, uh, Jewish, Christian to do that to judge it as good and evil. Here you see a bit of Mi'kmaq writing. Uh, aren't these aren't these uh, letters beautiful? They've they I like them. Um, the missionaries came to the Mi'kmaq pretty early on, and one of the first things they would, of course, teach the Mi'kmaq or try to teach them is the Our Father prayer, which looks like this. Our Father in heaven, and the heaven is that is a little star symbol. Kind of interesting. Maybe some of you know this prayer. Maybe some of you don't. Maybe some of you pray this one. Our Father who is in heaven, praised be your name. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins. Um, so that we likewise may forgive those who sin against us. And do not lead us into temptation, into sin, but deliver us from, from evil, for you are all-powerful. Amen. Uh, that's how the prayer goes. That last little bit is made up, but the first part is quoted by Jesus. Um, he was, uh, someone in this morning's class asked, Jesus was looking at his fellow Jews who were at the front of the temple praying in praying in a very active way. And Jesus had his BS detector on, and he said, you know what, guys? I think you're praying more for show than for sincerity's sake. So why don't you stop praying all day super loud so that everyone else can see? Why don't you pray in your heart? And it doesn't have to be difficult. It can be quite simple. Like, God, give me food today and help me do the right thing. Right? That's basically what that prayer says. And I, I think the essence of that message is, uh, is, is I think anyone would, would recognize, oh, okay, that's, that's nice and down to earth. That makes sense. Um, it has become... That kind of um, reminds me of my own prayer because one of the lines in there mm -hmm. is kind of directly in my du'a or my prayer. Um, and this, 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 uh, give us our sins and give us our bread. So that we stay off and keep us off the path of temptation. And you came up with that for yourself. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. We might have, or we might have not. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and it's just it's nice and simple. Um, um, in Christianity, it holds significant because Jesus is, is quoted to have said this. Okay, fine, whatever, we believe that. So it makes sense that Catholics want to, like, it made sense it became the biggest prayer in Christianity, and it makes sense that these Catholics would try to first teach them that and try to, yeah, translate it into their language, which, which is what we see here. Yeah, the Mi'kmaq, untainted, and then the ship on the horizon. And then, well, we know John Cabot in 1497, uh, Jacques Cartier in 1535, and then of course Samuel de Champlain in 1608. I think he started in 1604. Actually, look, there's quite a few. Uh, see how many First Nations, Mi'kmaq probably uh, are greeting him. Like that's those are big in number. Uh, here we see Champlain again, and he's painted like this royal king who arrives. You know, a flag waves majestically behind him. He stands there with. One hand on his hip, and you know the other one almost stretched forward—not quite, but um, 
uh, obviously the painter used some creative license. The painter may have been there or not, made some quick sketches or not, done everything from memory or just from hearsay. Uh, but there was definitely a way to paint these explorers. And the way to paint them was glorious. All right. I need to switch up my presentation for a second. We're going to meet the man who made it all possible, <laughs> the King of France. And this wasn't just any guy. This was the mighty King of France, King Henry the... How many is this? IV? The fifth, the fifth, the fifth. Nope. The four. fourth? V the fourth. Five. And when the I stands in front of the V, it's four. Yeah, it is four. And when the I stands after the V, it would be six. All right. And when it's just a V, it's five. You got it. Yay, Roman numeral. This is the French anthem. And if you think these guys had no humor, think again. The early version says, long live Henry IV, long live his valiant king. This fourfold devil with the three talents. Um, I'm sure they're referring to some kind of myth here about the king. Anyways, uh, of drinking, fighting, and womanizing goes the chorus. But the later version of this anthem goes, to hell with wars and enmity and spouses. That's right, to hell with spouses. Okay, let us all together sing as true friends. Clink the glasses, the roses and the lilies. And the rose and the lily you see here to the, to the right. Yeah, these guys, these guys love the good party, I think. <laughs> you know, to hell with spouses. <laughs> Let's drink some more. Okay. Fantastic. When you listen to the music, it, so it sounds more dramatic, but the text was rather... Hey, uh, here you see Henry IV at the Battle of the Arcs in 1589. And look how gloriously he is portrayed. He was a man of great wealth and great influence. This is his house. He lived in the Louvre in Paris. It's uh, fairly large. Here we see Henry IV of the Battle of the Ivory. Another valiant fight. Henry paid for this bridge in, uh, in Paris. It was quite, uh, and it still stands today, and it's quite beautiful. He paid for this little garden. I think it's a rather famous garden. Unfortunately, he didn't make it all the way. He got assassinated. As happens to such tragic heroes sometimes. Yeah, that was unfortunate. And so, he paid for the colony, Acadia, yes, and the first capital was Port Royal here on the on the north side of that southern island. We've seen this map before. Uh, so it started in 1604. Mm, and the French settlers got along with the Mi'kmaq, I would say. Um, the settlers knew, and perhaps because they had seen what the Dutch did with land that was underneath water and how to turn it into agricultural land, um, these French settlers knew how to build little dikes and pump out the water so that these salty uh, marshes, so, so land that was half underwater, but not fresh water, salty water, which crops don't grow in, like grass doesn't grow very well. They knew how to build little dikes, pump the water out, make, it, make the water table more sweet than salty, not by adding sugar, <laughs> but by keeping the seawater out. And, and through that, they were able to, to create agricultural land, land that these Mi'kmaq didn't use at all. And because the Mi'kmaq didn't use that land, the Mi'kmaq didn't have many issues with these Europeans uh, creating agricultural land in these marches. They were like, yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, so they got along pretty well, and they did not really consider this, themselves conquered. They, um, they simply thought, okay, we're living together here now. Got a little fuller, but that's about it. I see some comments about the end of class. Sorry, guys, class is done when I dismiss you.
Okay, let's keep going here. Here's a picture of 1702. So we're speaking 100 years after Samuel de Champlain is in, uh, in, in Quebec. And you see the blue area is where New France is expanded to. And you might think, why does it go through this lake? But then why this little blue thing here? And why the little blue thing at the bottom? is because they were following the river. And that's quite simply that. You see Spain, of course, 50 years later, look how much they expanded in, in 50 years. But one important thing changed. Um, here, the southern island of Nova Scotia is blue, but then in this one, it is purple. And that is because it was given, given, it was given to Britain. They didn't have to fight for it. Well, that's not quite true. There was a lot of fighting. And in the peace treaty, they gave it to Britain. France gave it to Britain. The peace treaty is called the Treaty of Utrecht, or Utrecht, if you want to really say it in Dutch. It was signed in 1713. And that's because all Europe was fighting. Spain was fighting with France, was fighting with England, was fighting with the Dutch. And... It was a big war and they really needed to settle it. Um, and they were signed in Utrecht. Where is Utrecht? Utrecht is here. And if you look at that image, you see those funny triangles that we have seen before. And those triangles are the defense systems that we saw on Fort Churchill. Do you remember? Maybe a little bit. Okay, this is... the city of Utrecht. And if you're wondering, hey, what happened <laughs> What happened to the middle of that church? <clears throat> a, uh, a storm happened to the middle of that church. I think it was a tornado. Okay. This church was built a long time ago, in 18, no, in 1382. You think, wow, that's like hundreds of years before exploration. You might be wondering why would they uh, why would they build such a high tower? Yeah, why would they build such a high tower? To the glory yeah. of God. Yeah. But high towers are vulnerable to windstorms and stuff. High tower. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 So in this city, this church was already there. I'm not sure if the middle part of the church was destroyed by the storm yet or by that uh, that uh, tornado I, th I think it was a tornado uh, but it was in this city uh already you know quite quite well established uh, in a sense not holland's major city but i think uh they wanted a smaller city that was sort of neutral um to sign the the peace treaty okay here is the peace treaty the treaty of utrecht and god they signed so many peace treaties uh wow. this of them this ended the war of the spanish succession and queen anne's war in north america European countries attacked each other in Europe, and their colonies also started to attack each other. It was one big war. The big winner, yay, but not yay. The big winner of this war was Britain. Yes. Yay! Yeah, I guess so. And so they got the southern island of Nova Scotia here in beautiful Peach. So Peach is now British, and yeah, the French did not really like it. Oh. No, not really. And in exchange, like uh, uh, to, 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 perhaps to annoy the British or perhaps to say, we're not giving up on Quebec, we're not giving up on that Northern Ireland, they built Fort Louisburg. And Fort Louisburg was the most expensive and largest fort in North America at the time. They didn't just build any fort, they built a very, very big one. Oh. 
And of course, this annoyed the British enormously. And so the British built Fort Halifax. Yay! George in Halifax. Okay, let's go back to that map for a second. You can see Halifax is here in the middle of the Peach Island. And Lewisburg is here. Not very far away from each other. Wow. Okay, the fact that the French built Fort Lewisburg really annoyed the governor of Boston. And he got the colonial British fleet together and attacked Fort Lewisburg in 1745. And here you can see it being attacked from all sides. Der Haven. I'm not sure why the title is in Dutch there. Okay. But that wasn't very long. Because oh my God. That was 1745. Okay. Um, then in 1748, Britain and France did a little bit of um, global exchange. You know, <gasps> I yes. give you that thing if you give me this thing. France owned a city in India called Madras. Cool. And Madras uh, was something the British really wanted. So the French said, sure, sure, you can have Madras in India. If we get Fort Lewisburg back. Oof. So the French got Fort Lewisburg back only three years after it was conquered. And they put lots of soldiers in it again. But these American colonies really didn't want that. And so 10 years later, in 1758, the British attacked Fort Lewisburg for a second time. No, they got to see a lot of action. Wow. All did right. they win or did they lose? And the British won a second time. Yay! And that's when it stayed in British hands. Now, let's have a quick tour, and this will be the last video, of Fort Lewisburg. Yay! None less than Rick Mercer himself. Very bad CPI. CPI? CGI. <laughs> yeah. Computer Generated Interface. In the early 1700s, the French built a fortress here in Lewisburg, Cape Breton. A huge construction job that, much like the Tory stimulus program, was way over budget and worked for about five minutes. Today, the Mercer Report invades the spectacular National Historic Site of Lewisburg. And here I am standing in the King's Bastion Barracks, and this is Ruby Fougere from Parks Canada. Hello, Ruby, how are you? Bienvenue, welcome, Rick. Thank I am you. fine. Thank you very much. Okay, talk to me about wow. uh, uh, Fortress Lewisburg, which is not a fort, it is a fortress. Fortress, that's right. Yep. And the difference between a fort and a fortress? A fortress is a walled town with civilians inside, and a fort is just a military stronghold. Yes, yeah, so this was an entire town in the 1700s. Yes. What was the population? Population, At the maximum. Maximum was about six to seven thousand. That's the population of Flin Flon, Manitoba. We're right here. Right French here. people in the 1700s. Can I put on some some period clothing? Yes. Because yes. I'm a sucker for yeah. the well, pantaloon or whatever it's called. <laughs> to be a historic interpreter is a very important job here, Rick. Because what we want I'll you to do. I'll take it very seriously. Yeah. Now, what do you do here, Carl? I am sergeant of the town militia. You certainly are. <laughs> do you arrest people? Not if I can help it. But occasionally you do. Occasionally, occasionally. It depends on how drunk and rowdy they get. Are you in the militia? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the militia. Do you like that? Yeah. People take your picture? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of pictures. Yeah. So you're pretty popular. Yeah. I play the fife. What's a fife? It's, well, it's a six. Fife and drum. Fife and drum corps. <laughs> I always thought it was a name of a pub. I didn't realize it was actually the, the fife goes with the drum. We go together. I feel like I'm about to blow out of a cannon. Where are you from, Max? Uh, we are from uh, Carcassonne, France. I see. And how are you enjoying our fort? Uh, Fortress. What, what I love, what I appreciate, it's all the people with the, with the old costume. That's mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic. It makes it, it, make it uh, alive. Very good uh, to see uh, how was uh, history. Did you know anything about Fortress oh, Lewisburg no. before you came? No, no, no. No, no, no. no. So you're I, learning. I think, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I'm a kid. I'm a children. <laughs> <laughs> now, Clifton, are you one of those kids in grade eight who gets in for free? Yeah. You are? Yeah. So how did you figure that out? Uh, 
Our teacher gave us a little slip and he said it was free. So any National Historic Site is free if you're in grade eight? Yeah. Now, so what did you come to see? Uh, you do stuff. Me do stuff? Yeah. How did you know I was going to be here? I, I didn't know I was going to be here until two days ago. My mom found out at the liquor store. <laughs> I feel quite mad. Oh wow, she looks so spiffy. You have any questions about history, just ask me. Troy, what do you do here, Troy? Oh god. I work help. in visitor experience. Okay. So when people come to visit us, we in visitor experience, we try to make sure that, that they, they connect. Are you insanely itchy down here? Yep. So they were just doomed to a life of itchiness in the ah. This is spectacular. It is so beautiful. The governor's private stock of animals okay. were kept in here. These are all heritage animals. And these were the actual stables that were used? Yeah, this was the governor's stables. Those are heritage breed turkeys. That's they, what a turkey should look they like. They certainly are. Hello, turkey, come here. You got something there on the tip of your nose. Oh, pigs, I love pigs. Here, pig, pig. I love to see a pig with an apple in its mouth. Bonjour, how are you? Good, very good. So now, Emil, you're here, you're taking care of the sheep. I am. Did, did they have the sheep on the go back in the 1700s? Yes, they did. They yes. did. I've been here that long. Come on, sheep. Come on, sheep. Um, I feel like Stephen oh, Harper wow. leaving his cabinet. Come on, sheep. Here um, go, Dick Caves. Go, John help. Beard. Turn left, cabinet. Turn left. Ah. Je m'appelle Gene Simmons, the kiss. So that's an 18 pounder, so you would actually have six pounds. pound and three quarters of black powder. That's what I'm gonna be lighting with this. The, the, someone's gonna say, the, and I'm gonna go, whoo. That's the noise I'm gonna make. That's the, dangerous. Who, and then, whoo. Bang. Whoo, what boom, boom, will go? Le boom. Take your time. Just the British are invading. <laughs> oh, that's good. Have you ever done that? Avo post. Oh, God, help. Prenez le culier. Et couvienez. Amorce. J'ai au crayon rouge. Au feu de feu. Get my stick. Refoule. I need one of these for the cottage, you know, for the jet ski. Bouchez la lumière! 